we are going to move on now to our uh, last presentation of the morning from Mojo Vision. Modern technology promises to make us more knowledgeable, more efficient, and more connected. But does it? In surrounding ourselves with screens and devices, maybe we're losing something of ourselves. Imagine having the freedom to walk away from our screens. Would we see differently? Could we see more clearly? Or would we just begin to see? We see a future where computing becomes invisible, where technology fades away. The important thing is finding an edge, even in friendly competition. Imagine an augmented reality platform that lets you move freely. A truly mobile device that allows you to see unobstructed. A device that organically maps your own content right into the world. What if you could confidently explore new cultures and languages, free from digital disruptions? Free to truly see eye to eye, forging lasting human connections. Imagine a world of seamless navigation, where you no longer need to keep your eyes glued to a map. What if you could feel like a local wherever you go? What if, with just a look, you could discover more than the eye can see? Just imagine the possibilities if you could truly interact with the world with that same look. It will help us provide better care for one another, allowing us to connect in crucial moments, providing vital information in an instant. It's hard to imagine our lives without a device in our hands, but imagine if you could replace the screens that pull your focus away with something that elevates the world around you. We don't have to imagine. We are turning science fiction into fact an augmented reality smart contact lens. What will you see? Eyes up. Over the past 60 years, we've seen incredible leaps in computing technology. The introduction of mainframe computers, mini computers, personal computers, the explosive growth of the internet and the World Wide Web, the freedom and versatility of mobile devices. Now we find ourselves at the beginning of the next wave of computing. With sales of smartphones beginning to plateau, we are seriously asking ourselves, what's next? What is that next wave going to be? Many people think that this will be some form of augmented reality, virtual reality, or mixed reality, where the physical and the digital worlds begin to merge. And we at Mojo agree. Succeeding the smartphone will be something even more powerful, more wearable, and more personal. Of course, the expectations for the future of computing are incredibly high. Popular culture and Hollywood have shown us a world where computing is ubiquitous, where there are no physical screens or devices, and you just wave your hands or speak naturally and information just appears. But the reality today is completely different. The state of the art in AR and VR is still big, bulky goggles or glasses. These products contain incredible technologies and are proving very useful for many specific use cases. But in their current form, they're not going to take the place of the smartphone in your pocket anytime soon. I started my Mojo Vision journey in 2011. I developed cataracts and I underwent surgery to implant devices called intraocular lenses in my eyes to restore my cloudy vision. I woke up from the operation and I could immediately see, but I also started to discover some deficiencies in my vision. I thought, it's the 21st century. Why don't I have Steve Austin's bionic vision like in the 1970s TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man? And that's when my idea for Mojo Lens was born. We founded Mojo Vision because we knew we could build something that would fundamentally change how we access, see, and interact with information and the world. Put Mojo Lens on in the morning and throughout your day, you will have access to timely information without losing focus on the world around you. 
Mojo Lens is designed not to bombard you with data, but to elevate your vision by providing the information you need exactly when it's needed, all while letting you look like yourself. When it's not in use, the technology just fades away. We call this concept invisible computing. Ultimately, Mojo Lens is for consumers who are looking for the benefits of invisible computing. A hands-free, eyes-up experience, but building the consumer market will take time, so we're targeting the first Mojo Lens to address unmet needs in vertical markets, where its ability to deliver mission-critical information will be highly valued. Imagine the firefighter who can see where they are in a smoky building, or an ER doctor who can quickly triage an emergency, or the repair technician who needs heads-up access to checklists and schematics. But who's going to want to wear Mojo Lens? We don't believe that smart glasses and smart contact lenses are an either-or proposition. For Mojo, our initial customers will be the 130 million people across the 16 countries that we are targeting who already wear contact lenses. People who have chosen those lenses so that they can look like themselves. Mojo's invisible computing solution will be a platform that gives you everyday superpowers and an invisible edge throughout your day. But before it does any of that, it first has to be a great contact lens that improves your natural vision even when it's off. Mojo Lens built-in display will give you augmented reality wherever you look. There are no field of view limitations because the lens projects content wherever you're looking. It even works with your eyes closed, putting you into an instant VR world. The applications are nearly limitless, from being able to see in the dark or low light situations, to augmenting your memory with instant information, showing you real-time translations, or giving you a virtual teleprompter. While augmented reality in a contact lens is certainly exciting, that's just the beginning. One of our first medical applications is using AR overlays like edge detection and contrast enhancements to help people with vision impairments such as glaucoma and macular degeneration. But it doesn't stop there. By building a wearable platform on the eye that has power and data, we're opening the door to a long and exciting list of health and wellness features that either we or our partners could implement. Diagnostic tools, real-time disease monitoring, and biometric feedback. These are all possibilities we intend to explore as we mature the Mojo platform. Which brings us to why we're here today. Our ask of NASA is to consider integrating the Mojo Lens platform into NASA's upcoming space missions. We believe that ambitious programs like Artemis deserve a 21st century computing solution that can deliver unique advantages over other devices. Besides its ability to deliver mission-critical information that literally cannot be missed even with your eyes closed, Mojo Lens will easily fit inside the helmets of our future astronauts and do so with minimal weight, bulk, or battery. It can be used hands-free, controlled with your voice, or just your eyes, and it will reduce the need for many of the displays and screens that add costly weight to every mission. Many of the use cases we envision are dual use. They can be developed to help astronauts in space just as they can help consumers here on Earth. For example, Mojo Lens will be able to assist with day-to-day -day operations, providing step-by-step -step checklists for experiments and maintenance, controlling objects and equipment within the craft, as well as display critical flight and EVA task information. It can also be used for remote assistance, allowing an expert on Earth or inside a spacecraft or habitat to see what the astronaut sees and to assist them in their important maintenance or medical tasks. This capability will also be very useful for training exercises and ergonomics to study where astronauts are looking when completing different assignments. Lastly, Mojo Lens can be used to perform continuous health monitoring and to detect changes in mental health of the wearer, critical for long and arduous missions. Having constant psychological biometrics for all crew members can help controllers monitor intercrew dynamics and influence emerging conflicts before they erupt. Building the world's first AR contact lens is a systems engineering problem, and therefore we've had to innovate in many different areas. For example, displays, optics, wireless communications, sensors, and materials, all while keeping the system small, low power, and of course, safe. We embed all of our smart components into a time-tested contact lens platform called a scleral lens. A scleral lens rests on the white part of your eye, and it doesn't touch your cornea. Now what we do is we custom fit each lens to your eye so that it's extremely comfortable to wear and doesn't rotate or slip on the eye. We've also patented a method that maximizes the oxygen delivered to your eye, which is another critical element of contact lens comfort and eye health. The Mojo lens includes thin film, biosafe batteries to power the system, as well as motion sensors to enable the world's most accurate eye tracking. We've also developed an extremely low power image sensor 
that's used for computer vision and scene detection. But at the heart of the Mojo lens is the world's smallest and densest dynamic display. The pixel to pixel spacing in our display is only 1.8 microns, giving it a density of 14,000 pixels per inch. With this, we can display crisp text, photos, and video in a package that's less than half a millimeter in diameter. Now on top of that display, we put an elegantly complex multi-surface micro-optic that we make out of a single piece of plastic. This micro-optic focuses light from the display directly onto the retina. So sometimes we get asked, won't the system block your natural vision? And the answer is of course, no. It turns out that the display is so small and close to your eye that your eye essentially looks around the display. It's the same principle at work in a Cassegrain telescope like the Hubble. Our current system delivers a monochrome green image, but we're also working on a color display for next generation products. Mojo Lens is designed to be worn on both eyes. This gives you stereoscopic vision and each lens communicates to a Mojo designed accessory where we put the compute and the network interfaces. For example, the Mojo accessory can wirelessly connect to your smartphone or to the cloud. The accessory is also where our software applications reside. It's worn near the head, and in our first generation product, the accessory can be built into a helmet or a hat, safety glasses, or even a necklace. One interesting function that the accessory also serves is to capture the eye motion data from the contact lenses, compute the updated digital view based on the user's new eye position, and then send that view back to the lenses, all in under 10 milliseconds. This ensures that the AR content stays still in the real world, even as you move your eyes. We are often asked, how do you control Mojo Lens? And the answer is with your eyes. It turns out that your eye is an extremely accurate pointing device. With our built-in eye tracking in each lens, we believe we've unlocked the ultimate hands-free user interface. With just a glance, you can select tools and access content effortlessly. Over the past several years, the Mojo team has been hard at work taking the principles and learnings of our early research to develop successive generations of Mojo Lens. Starting in late 2019, over 10 Mojo employees have worn and tested the Mojo Lens, and now we are working on the next generation prototype, which includes all the system elements we've discussed today. Our plan is to optimize that feature complete lens and lock our first product for clinical trials within just a few years. Since all contact lenses are classified as medical devices by the FDA, we are building the quality systems and culture necessary to ensure our lens meets or exceeds safety standards for all day use. Mojo Lens was designated as a breakthrough device by the FDA because of its potential to help people with vision impairments regain their mobility and independence. This designation allows us to actively engage with the FDA throughout the development process and reduce program risk. Creating a safe product is just one element of building trust with our customers. We also know that we have to safeguard their privacy and build secure systems they can rely on. We take these challenges very seriously and have already begun reaching out to the optometric community and to thought leaders in ethics who can help guide our design decisions. Mojo Vision was founded just five years ago. And in that short period of time, we've made tremendous progress towards inventing the future of invisible computing. As a successful serial entrepreneur, I've learned that one of the key secrets to success is assembling and enabling an incredible team if you want to solve really complex problems. The Mojo team is now over 100 employees from a wide range of world-class organizations. Most are engineers, one-third of which have PhDs. Our team has innovated in many different areas and filed over 110 patents across every aspect of our technology stack. We've been fortunate to have raised over $159 million in private funding from some of the world's leading venture capital and strategic investors. And we're beginning to see momentum in vertical markets, including government agencies, with contracts totaling over $15 million. And all of our efforts are managed by an all-star executive team that has built and shipped groundbreaking technologies, consumer products, and medical devices that we all depend on and enjoy every day. I like to say, if it doesn't break the laws of physics, then it's possible. And proving that something like Moja Lens is possible motivates us each and every day to invent the future. Ultimately, we believe that we can help people achieve their potential without sacrificing their humanity. That's the promise of invisible computing. Thank you very much for your time today. Eyes up.
All right. Thank you very much, Mojo. Let's open up the questions. <clears throat> I'll start. John Carr here from Marshall. Uh, I was okay. curious, uh, a great technology uh, for sure. I was curious um, how much of the core uh, subsystem technology, the batteries, the image sensor, et cetera, is your IP and how much of it is licensed or purchased from somebody else? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We we've had to build a lot of the technology. We have our own ASIC team. Uh, the image sensor is our own custom design. The wireless link, the, the radio is all custom. But we also try to work with other companies wherever we can because there's plenty to do here. So uh, we work with other companies on the batteries and some of the other motion sensors, for example. Um, if you have another technology that you think could fit in here, we'd love to put it in. Uh, it doesn't have to doesn't have to be all our stuff. I had a question on the contract. Is it the, are they the same size as normal contracts or how much bigger are they and are they comfortable? I mean, you said that you fit them, but contract or people have trouble wearing them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So in, for my own journey in coming to contact lenses, that's contact lenses are not my background. I've come to understand there is not really any such thing as a normal contact lens. There are many different types of contact lenses, and those different types solve different kinds of problems. So a scleral lens is a type of contact that uh, millions of people wear. Uh, when you say normal, you probably refer to like a daily soft disposable uh, contact lens. Um, so this is clearly different than that, but it's still a high volume contact lens platform that corrects people's uh, astigmatism, for example, or if you have keratoconus and you have a, a misshapen cornea, this is another kind of contact lens you would wear. What we do is we make that contact lens, the shape of it, fit the shape of your eye. Your eye is actually not a sphere. It's more like my fist. It has bumps and weird shape profile to it. So when you make a, a contact lens that actually fits the shape of your eye, then there aren't places that dig in or feel bad. It's very comfortable. So uh, yes, these are comfortable lenses. They may not be the type that you are most familiar with, but many people wear them on a daily basis. So you are a hardware company, as I probably understand it. Who, who is doing the software for all the VR tools that you describe? Yeah, we're, we, um, so we have historically to date been hardware centric because that's where a lot of the hard problem was. You say you're going to make a, a, a smart contact lens that's mostly you know physics engineering applied physics that sort of thing right and and uh the contact lens manufacturing side of this but now that we've matured on all that hardware we are now starting to delve into software very deeply so we've recently hired uh a guy uh who's our svp of software and he's building up a software team as we speak and uh i imagine that over the next several years, the weight of our company will shift heavily towards software in terms of total headcount. All right, we actually have a question from one of the live streams um, asking what happens if there is a cyber attack slash virus and the virus causes, for example, high intensity lighting, does your eyesight go? Yeah. Um, I'm going to I'm going to also uh, ask Steve Sinclair to answer that one. But we are specifically engineering this contact lens to not be able to hurt you, that it just it can't put out the kinds of energy, light level or what have you to be able to hurt you. So even if we could imagine some mode, it just it just it can't hurt you. Some some mode where there's a virus, it can't it cannot harm you. Um, Steve, do you have you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, as we build out the ecosystem for this this platform, um, it'll have a, an app ecosystem that is very similar to, to, to smartphones today, where we will be able to um, understand what people are trying to put on the platform, be able to do app reviews before they become uh, uh, part of the platform. So we'll be able to, to, to catch uh, catch issues like that as well. Any other questions? Yeah, I'd like to go back to the apps. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean. Um, are you open to third party people developing apps for your device, or is it you want to do it all in house? We're, we're very open to, we want third party apps. Steve, you want to take that one again? 
Sure. So yeah, we're 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 definitely interested in building an app ecosystem that third party developers can uh, write apps for. There's no way to possibly guess all the different use cases that people are going to want to use this product for. And so opening it up similar to again the platforms that we're we're familiar with is is a good move. Early on, we're going to be very measured on on who we partner with uh, for for applications. They're going to be very specific vertical apps, and we may write many of those ourselves to start with uh, to work out uh, kinks in our SDK and make sure that it's it's a solid platform, uh, which is not unlike uh, how uh, the iPhone uh, brought uh, its app store to market a couple of years after the first product. So um, the first one is, could you talk a little bit more about how it's powered and how it gets data and how much bandwidth the lens has? And then also, uh, I think I asked this for the uh, another company doing AR. It's not possible to get like a blue screen of death in front of your eyes, right? Um, you wouldn't okay. be able to see uh, anything. Working, working backwards, yeah. uh, you can always make it stop. Mm -hmm. Our view of the future here is not that there is content and stuff up around you all the time. We actually want to try to allow us each to be more human instead of kind of what, what we like to think of as less human with our eyes down and our mobile phones all the time. So we want to get you back up into the real world and only show you information when you want it. And you can always make it go away. Um, working backwards, so that's the last question I think you asked there. Mm -hmm. The, the power and data, we have um, very tiny micro batteries that go and power the system. That's how, that's how the energy uh, is delivered to the rest of the system. The system takes very little power. We have spent a lot of time engineering ultra low power chip technologies, ultra low power wireless link. Uh, we had to build our own wireless link and our own radios in order to accomplish the power and speed trade-off that we needed. Uh, and size. You can imagine that if we go and try to buy a, a Wi-Fi chip or a Bluetooth chip or something and stick it in the contact lens, those things are just too power hungry and too large to be able to fit in there. So our our uh, our data rates are in the tens of megabits per second, like 40 megabits per second uplink to the uh, to the contact lens. So there's quite a lot of data there to push all the viewable content and sensor data back and forth across the link. Um, did I did I answer all the questions or was was there another one in there? Nope, um, that's it. I just have a, a quick follow up on being able to make it stop. What if you're driving or something? What's the mechanism for emergency? You know, turning off the lens. So there are uh, a number of mechanisms that we're still working through. Right, we're kind of pre product, so we're still trying to eat our own dog food and figure out all the different methodologies. But uh, as we've mentioned in the video, one of the ways to control the lens is with your eyes. And so there is a way to, with one glance, dismiss anything that's in front of you. That's one of the concepts that we're prototyping. But there are also other concepts that involve, you know, physical mechanisms. You know, you can just flip a switch or push a button and just just disengage, make it stop for a period of time. Thank you. Yeah. So, so will there always be an on-off switch visible to the user? <laughs> As I said, these are these are kind of prototyping concepts. Our view is that um, the the accessory device that you wear should be very inconspicuous. We're going for trying to get towards social transparency. It could be something like a necklace, as we mentioned in the video, that it sits underneath your shirt um, and so is not is not readily visible. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to leave that answer a little open for the moment. Okay, so I was referring to an on-off switch in the in the vision, so they control with your eye. Would there always be something you could see to look at to turn it back on? <clears throat> um, one of the really fun things we've discovered about working on this is that with um, fantastic eye tracking and a display all working together, you can really rethink the user interface and rethink the whole concept of buttons and activation. Um, and how you bring th things up with your eyes and how you dismiss them and how you select them. So um, I think the the concepts of there has to be a button in order to make something happen also kind of go away. So um, suffice it to say, our, our view is you should always be able to make it stop. You should always be able to make it go away uh, and focus on the real world. Are you, guys, 
Sorry, are you going after um, class three medical device approval or is it PMA approval? Um, and then where are you at in your regular FDA regulatory pathway? Yeah, uh, Steve, you want to take that one? Sure. So um, many contact lenses are, are classified as class two. Um, and so our, our initial pathway is class two de novo. Um, there is a possibility it could be a class three, and we'll know that when we do our pre-sub. Um, and so we haven't done that yet. But as we mentioned in the video, we are um, engaged with the FDA through their Breakthrough Devices program. And so we are uh, in constant sprints with them on different topics uh, ahead of our, our formal clinical trials and submission. When do you plan on submitting your package? Uh, so we're we're a couple of years away, and we can talk in more detail on the impact tables. Hey, others. Hey, this is yeah, this is Ben. Uh, quick uh, technical question, like uh, extra two of them. Uh, what's your field of view, and um, is it full you know full field or uh, or not? And what's your current battery life, and what are you targeting? Mm -hmm. Uh, working backwards again, uh, our view on battery life is that uh, what we're what we're striving for is an all-day use. Put put it on in the morning and take it off at night. Now that doesn't mean that the battery in the contact lens could provide you AR or VR content continuously for whatever eight or twelve hours. You know, think more along the lines of duty cycling, like your mobile phone or your or your smartwatch, where the screen is not always on. So with, uh, with duty cycling, our goal is to make it last all day long. Um, what were the other questions there? I'm sorry, I've lost the other ones. Uh, uh, field of view, is it full field of view or is it uh, partial? Uh, it's, it's what you would call partial, but um, it's actually another one of those areas just like the, the, the user interface that's really fascinating. When, when you are looking at the room you're in right now and your eyes are moving around in your room, you are not actually viewing that room with ultra high resolution. It feels like everything's high fidelity. It's not. You're scanning a very small portion of your field of view called your fovea with high resolution. You're scanning it around the room and you're building up in your brain a model of the surroundings. And that model to you, you perceive that model to be a high resolution model of your surroundings. But it's really mostly made up by your brain filling in gaps and so on. With the contact lens display, the display sits right on your eye. And whenever you move your eye to the left or to the right or up or down, the display moves with you. And in the same way, so in the same way, a limited field of view on the, on the display can actually feel much more expansive because wherever you want to look, the content is always there. And you end up building up in your brain a bit of a model of that digital content. Um, it's a Kind of a difficult concept to explain with words here, but uh, field of view is a topic that doesn't directly apply to uh, an AR contact lens. Mark, did you have Thanks, a no, comment? That's interesting. Um, I, had a, I had a quick question. Um, so Samsung, a uh, number of years ago, built a, a contact lens with a camera in it. I, mm. I don't think it ever seen any traction have you guys looked at that or 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 considered that and additionally um it can the con i know the um air force was working on some technology that could change the ir absorption of the eye to detect where camouflage was over certain tanks and so forth have you and have you guys considered that there, there is a whole world of awesome application that, uh, that can be unlocked here by using image sensors with different um, wavelength sensitivity outside of the visual range where a human normally sees and being able to pipe those views into the contact lens with false color overlay kinds of, uh, kinds of views. So, um, Yes, can, do we envision that over time we can integrate other kinds of cameras into the system broadly? They may be external cameras that you're viewing and not actually mounted on the contact lens, but then to, to give you those uh, other wavelength views, yes, that's something that's very exciting and, and we're working on. Uh, but the short answer is we do have an image sensor in the contact lens. Uh, right now that image sensor is heavily targeted at our low vision user population. What we do is we take the imagery off of that 
image sensor and directly pipe it over to the display. So the data never leaves the lens. And in that process, what we can do is we can, we can take those imagery, those images from the, con from the uh, image sensor, enhance them with contrast or edge detection. And then when you, when you see the display, that display, the edges, let's say edges, the edges are perfectly overlaid on top of the real world, no matter where you look. So if you're looking at a person, you're going to see the outline of their face. Um, and if you snap your eyes over to some other object, immediately the edge detection is working on the, on the next object. Um, so uh, did that answer the question, Steve? Drew, anything to add to that? No, no, it did. Thank you. It was Mark Jones from Sprout. I, 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 do, I do appreciate it. And what, are, are you guys going for another round of capital? I mean, what, what's the build capital requirements on the end game here? I'm just curious. Yeah, Drew, you want to take that one? Sure. This obviously is a very expensive program. We've already raised over $159 million, and uh, it's going to take more than that. So we do continue to talk to investors and expect to raise additional capital and announce those uh, fundraisings in the future. One, one more. Based on that, what's your target price for, for the user? Uh, Steve, you want to you jump on that one? Sure. So when we when we reach scale, our goal is to have you know, two lenses plus our accessory um, be comparable to a high end smartphone. Um, and so that's the expectation is that you will wear these lenses for a year and you'll need to replace them on, a, on an annual basis. So it'd be um, some sort of subscription model. Thank you very much. And Max, I'm throwing it back to you. Well, I'd like to say thank you to, to Mojo, uh, first of all, uh, uh, appreciate the conversation. Thank you so much for the work that you've done and uh, getting to the top 10 is an achievement uh, in itself. And all the work you guys have put in uh, is, is, uh, was really phenomenal. It was great to work with all of you. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, now, uh, as Tom said, uh, we are going to declare the winners uh, and the winners will be receiving one of these beautiful NASA uh, iTech trophies uh, at some point in the near future. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm Harry Park, Chief Technologist of Ames, and it's my pleasure to announce the winners today. i first like to thank all the judges. Um, the judging, I thought, was uh, we had a diverse set of opinions, and I really appreciate the um, the investor uh, and the external uh, input on, on the technologies. Um, all of the presenters were excellent. I thought the presentations at this time were incredible quality. All of the um, um, companies that's presented uh, received significant support for, from at least some of the judges for, for, their, for their technology and position. So it really was a very difficult job to, to judge. Um, the judging period of time was, was short. Um, uh, but anyway, so the final decision, we, we selected uh, uh, three companies, uh, a magnetic vision. Um, so, so it's a virtual retina display. It has uh, potential applications for NASA, particularly using it in, in spacesuits uh, for displaying uh, uh, things that are of interest to us uh, could potentially lighten spacesuits because we don't need as many display, uh, particularly on curved structures. The second was from Mojo. It's a, um, um, augmented reality. Uh, I really like their vision, a uh, uh, vision for a future where computing becomes invisible. I thought that vision, vision is that integration of, of the augmented reality and stuff into to, our, our, our mission scenario has a lot of potential. And the third is Autolift. Um, they have a, a technology to, to treat the symptoms of vertigo. It is unique. Uh, for the NASA application, it is the treatment of motion sickness. And, and it has applications to astronauts. But for commercial uh, space, for space tourism, uh, motion sickness is likely to be a significant issue, particularly if someone's only going up for a week. You don't want to spend a million or two million dollars and not be able to enjoy it. 
Uh, so this has a lot of potential in, in for NASA. And I'd like to thank all of the presenters. I thought they were all excellent. Um, and I hope that we can follow up with all of you in the next uh, few months. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Drew Perkins, uh, the CEO of Mojo. Um, I would also like to thank NASA, NASA iTech, all of the judges, um, all the listeners and, and the audience as well. Uh, we're, we're, what we're taking on here is uh, just so in, incredible and, and broad, we're taking on so many technologies all at once. Um, a lot of people call what we're doing a moonshot. Personally, I call it a star shot, and we're just really happy and excited that the people that really do moonshots and uh, space travel here recognize it as such. Uh, so we'd like to thank um, also my team. Um, you don't pull this thing off with uh, a person, a small set of people. It takes an amazing team of people to pull off this set of technologies that we're pulling off. I'd like to thank our investors uh, who have put you know, roughly $160 million uh, into, into this company and this uh, project already. I'd like to thank all of our customers in government uh, and everywhere else that believe in us and and uh, are helping us uh, get there. And I'd also like to specifically thank uh, Kira Blackwell uh, for giving us the chance to uh, get into the ITEP program uh, and uh, being here. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and we're just so excited and uh, really uh, look forward to interacting with, with NASA and, and all of its missions. Uh, in the future as we build this product. Thanks. Congratulations to the whole, uh, to all the participants and, and especially to the winners. Before we uh, head out, I want to just uh, give a big thank you to the NIA team. Uh, you guys have done a great job. Um, this was my first event and, uh, and between the interactions that we had with the companies, but also uh, all of the facilitating that's been done, uh, all of the all of the work and the coaching, and uh, and quite frankly, you guys holding my hand through this as I learned it too. I really appreciate all of you guys, uh, and this was a great experience for me, and I th I think it's been a great experience for everybody. So thank you guys. Uh, I want to make sure that anybody who's watching the live stream right now that you guys are aware that we have our cycle two event coming up on October fifteenth and sixteenth. So please join us for that, where we will have another round of 10 companies uh, showing us how their dual-use technology can benefit NASA while still stimulating commercial markets. Thank you.